Hey, Emil. Uh, how's it going, man? My name is Jesse Hobson from Cinedump.com. Hey, Jesse. How are you? I'm doing just fine, man. Um, so, from a coroner to an undertaker, Emil Hirsch does it again. I watched uh, Never Grow Old last night, and and wow, man. Wow, wow is all I have to say. Oh, thank you. So, how did you get involved with, with that project? Well, um... They, I had read another script that Ivan Kavanaugh was going to make called The Disassembled Man, and it was really interesting. And I had a Skype call with him, and he was talking about how he was going to make this this Western. And he said, and he kind of mentioned it, sort of like there might be something in there for you, and then my agent had sort of mentioned something. And I really liked Ivan, um, just as a, just as a, a mind... And as a, just talking to him about movies, he's so eloquent and he's so meticulous and specific about what he likes. And he has such a kind of cinema knowledge that I was like, this is a guy to really work with. So um, I asked my agent about it and they ended up sending me the script and I, I really liked it. And uh, and it kind of, I attached myself to it. And when Ivan... Um, we we went along trying to, trying to get it made and it was just something that I... I was really, there were a lot of different reasons why I was excited to do it, and I'd, I'd always wanted to make a Western, and I'd never uh, made one. This one felt like a little bit different. Um, even the locale, you know, being set um, on the California Trail, but the fact that we shot it in uh, Luxembourg and Ireland, it, it, it gave the locations a different type feel than your kind of standard um, cactus and, 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 and dust and tumbleweed Westerns. Yeah, I, I had read that it was shot in in Ireland in November. I was curious as to what yeah, the, the the filming conditions were like. This this was the most um, challenging shoot physically that I have had since Into the Wild. Um, the only reason it was because it's just we shot it in Luxembourg and Ireland, and it was super cold. It was even colder in Luxembourg than it was in Ireland. In Luxembourg, where all the house scenes are set and the, and the, and the barn scene, um, and there was just, there's no buildings out there. Yeah. There was literally no buildings. So when we would go, you know, we would live, we would kind of, there'd be a couple of rooms in the in the cabin that we would stay, but it was incredibly muddy, and Piers, McGrail, and Ivan, uh, Piers was the director of photography. They really liked this muddy look at the house. So we had like six inches of mud around the house at all times. So if you walked anywhere, it was just icy cold mud. Um, and and the, the thing about the period clothing too is that you, you wear the period clothing and even if you're wearing like winter period clothing, it's still really cold. Yeah. Like, there's a limit to how warm period clothing is. So... It was there was just a, a coldness to the shoot and and kind of an outdoorsy feel where you know if you're in a cabin in the middle of nowhere even if you're in one of the rooms you sort of still feel like you're outdoors because there's no like heating um so there was a there was a a, a certain kind of uh, uncomfortableness to the shooting conditions which you can kind of feel when you watch the movie. When you watch the movie, it looks like a very uncomfortable world to live in. Um, uh, yeah, I can definitely agree because, like, there are there are scenes when you can visibly see the breath in the air and, like, kind of how you mentioned the the mud being around the the area constantly. It it seemed like ultimately not only were the the characters trudging through those those environments, but the cast and crew. You know, for those people that know about behind the scenes, I'm sure that that was pretty obvious as well. Um, some other difficulties I was I was curious about, like I know you're from California, but how how was it keeping up that Irish accent? Like, how was that difficult at all for you? Yeah, the accent was kind of an interesting thing because you know there's the whole um, there's like this cliche of like whenever the American actors do accents, they always suck, and the Brits and the Australians are always the masters of the accent. And I was kind of hyper aware of that. Yeah. So I was. It was one of those things where 
they got me this guy, Brendan Gunn. He's actually one of the best voice coaches in the world, and he's also Irish. And so I just sort of started working with him for, you know, over a month in advance, and he just had me, he, he broke down the entire accent for me over time, little by little kind of building a foundation for the accent, and got to the point where before we started shooting, I just made the decision to, and it's not like I was staying in character, but I stayed in the accent for the entire film. Yeah. Um, which was intense because like even when I would talk just to anybody, like talk to my mom, I have this Irish accent, which is pretty funny. <laughs> and when I was about to, when I was about to rap, the thing that I was actually the most looking forward to wasn't even, like, going back to L.A. or, or even being in the warmth. It was honestly, I was looking forward to speaking in my own voice again. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I watch MMA, and, like, you know, there's guys like McGregor, and they, obviously, that is their natural, you know, dialect. But, I mean, even you, like... It, it it felt very natural from like a viewer's perspective, so I, I wanted to uh, applaud you on that because I know how difficult that can be. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I think it would have. I mean, the only reason why I stayed in the accent the entire time was because I just en I just ended up not thinking about it anymore after that, and I think that that. You know, that's that's just sort of one of the reasons to do it. Because if I didn't do that and I was just popping in and out of it, you know, it might have been a little bit more self-conscious or something like that. Yeah. I, I touched on it a little bit earlier, and I have to mention it a, a little bit more. Uh, the Autopsy of Jane Doe was an absolute fantastic treat. Um, I was just curious about that experience and working with Brian Cox. Yeah, I'm... I talked to Eugene Doe, I had just a tremendous time making, and that was a, uh, it was a very pressurized shoot, you know, yeah. in the sense that it was like one of the most technical performances I've had to give, because there were so many, so many tools, and we would shoot these long masters where we would do these really long examination scenes, and I was like, you know, I'm like the, Brian's assistant, so he'd be like demanding tools from me, and I'd be running around doing the tools, and you know, all this technical dialogue and stuff, but uh, I really had a great time, and I was so proud to have made a movie with Andre over it all, um, and he's going to just have such a huge career now. Yeah, um, Andre, And fantastic. Uh, it was really, it was, he's just a great dude, and it was really, um, it was really uh, pretty wild, um, you know, getting to see how, that film has had a life since it came out. You know, I mean, people uh, have people really responded to it, and even the reviews when it came out. I mean, I, I, I knew. I mean, I knew we were making something special, and I really believed in it. But even believing in Andre and enjoying the script as much as I did, I think we were all a little taken aback by just how um, effusive the reaction was. Even though it didn't make a hundred million dollars, you know, it was like it was so well reviewed. We were it kind of blew our minds, you know. Yeah, I actually saw it at like a like a midnight preview. Not no one knew what we were gonna see, and uh, like it was just like, hey, there's this mystery movie that's gonna play tonight, and you guys want to stay around, stick around. And uh, I was I was blown oh, away. Wow. Yeah. So even with that perspective, so awesome. it was it was amazing, man. Everyone everyone stuck around and everyone had a blast, and that was that was fantastic. Um, Andre's next film, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. You you're about my age, and I grew up with those books. Do you have any plans on checking out that film, or what do you, what do you think about that actually? Oh yeah. That way? I think it's awesome. Um, I love. Del Toro, he's the executive producer and creator of this uh, TV show, Troll Hunters, for Netflix that I do one of the voices on. I took over the voice for Anton Yelchin after he passed away. Oh. Um, of Jim Lake Jr. on Troll Hunters. And I just have so much respect for Del Toro and for Andre, and together they'll be so good. And I loved those books growing up. I always 
um, was scared at night <laughs> and regretted reading them. Uh, I'm I'm gonna wrap up here. Um, for, I just want to, Emil, thank you for your time. I I, uh, I went and saw Girl Next Door opening weekend for my birthday when it came out back in in 2004. Oh my gosh! So I've been anticipating this interview oh, that's awesome. ever since then. So I just want to say thank you for the the many hours of entertainment and thank you again for your time. Um, I can't wait to see what you got oh, up your sleeve you so next. Much. And, uh, yeah, always a fan, dude. I, I always, always anticipate every one of your releases. So thank you for your time, buddy. Oh, well, thank you so much. All right. Bye, Jesse. Bye, buddy.